Yo, what's up, everyone? I'm excited about today's guest on the show, and his name is David Hayward, also known as a naked pastor. And David's a former church planner and a pastor who eventually left a professional paid clergy and started up a blog called The Naked Pastor back in 2006, uh, which initiated his public analysis of religion, religious community, and spirituality through his writings, his art, his cartoons, calling himself the graffiti artist on the walls of religion. Uh, he's also written books such as uh, Without a Vision, My People P- Will Prosper, uh, Deliberation of Sophia, and his latest one, Questions Are the Answers. And he also just launched an online community called The Lasting Supper, where people can learn and live in spiritual independence. So David, it's good to have you on the show, man. Thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, finally. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, I don't remember exactly when, but I came across your cartoon several years ago. I don't know if you knew this, but I, I lived back in the Philippines before. So that's yeah, I where I, that. Oh, you did? Okay. Yeah. So that's where I just stumbled upon your cartoons. I don't even know how. It probably just appeared on Facebook somehow. And, and I thought that they were so interesting. You know, not only were they, they funny, which is what I like, <laughs> uh, but I found them to be very powerful as well in the sense that uh, sometimes a picture can get a message across better than a, than a nice theological argument, you know. Uh, yeah, that's what they say a picture for a thousand words. Exactly, you know. But yeah. but first off, and I'm sure you get asked this a lot, but how did you end up being called the naked pastor? And don't worry, I won't ask you what you're wearing right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, we have nice weather today, so I've got shorts and uh, t-shirt <laughs> and sandals. So nice. Not, not so naked. <laughs> no, it's, yeah. yeah, it's totally PG. I mean, you know, I, uh, I, you, you've heard of the naked chef and the naked archaeologist mm. and things like that. But um, I think, I think uh, what the way it happened was I just came up with the name in my head, Naked Pastor, and I put a bid in for the name and I totally forgot about it. Mm. And then some months down the road, I was informed by the, by the uh, domain name place that I'd won the auction and okay. I, my heart sank because i thought oh no i forgot about it and i wondered how much i owed and uh, anyway it was something like 60 dollars, which was a steal uh, <laughs> so I, I i bought the name before that it was called church pundit and oh, okay. that's, that, that's kind of arrogant you know <laughs> and stuffy sounding so naked pastor was a lot cooler yeah and it seems to really catch for people but it's basically me just bearing my soul nice. nothing else Nice. A pastor bearing a soul and being vulnerable and honest about his his struggles, and um, I did it online, mm-hmm. and you know it's uh, it's really caught on. The name, you know, I know it, it, the name is problematic at the same time because schools, libraries, uh, some businesses block the name because the word, the word naked is in it. Yeah, so it's kind of a hassle that way. But uh, the brand had built up to that point where I couldn't let it go. So. Nice. No, that's cool, man. I, li- I like the name. <laughs> yeah, I do too. It, it got my attention. So, <laughs> you know, but but you have a really interesting journey. You know, what I finally got to to know about it more once I read your book. You know, the questions are the answers, and yeah. and I'd like for you to share your story with my listeners. You know, your background, the stages you went through that you mentioned yeah. in the book, and and how you ended up uh, just being where you are today. So, if you could just share your story with us. Yeah, I you know I I grew up in a religiously aware Christian home and you know we were, our church attendant was sporadic when I was growing up but when I was in my teens I got uh, as we say born again or saved and um, was in a Baptist church okay. got, got heavily involved in youth group and uh, you know we switched to a Pentecostal church in, in Canada um, oh, that's, a big jump. The, that's a big jump yeah <laughs> yeah well man I've made bigger ones so yeah. just fun <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, so, yeah, so I went from Baptist to Pentecostal as a young, as a youth, and mm. you know, was part of the youth group. And, and then I went to Bible College, uh, um, Central Bible College, Springfield, Missouri, which is a Pentecostal school. And um, for, I met my wife Lisa. Nice. And uh, you know, we married young, twenty-one and nineteen. Uh, went from there to seminary in Boston, Gordon Conwell Theological Seminary. And we kind of drift started drifting away from you know uh, Pentecostalism. My wife was Pentecostal as well, okay. and um, ended up um, in the Presbyterian Church. Long story short, I got ordained as a Presbyterian minister in Canada. Served there for a while. Then you know 
I don't know, it just got kind of dry and <laughs> depressing and nothing against the Presbyterian church. It's That's just all good. I, I, <laughs> Your experience. Um, in my experience, I just, I missed, I missed um, the passion of worship and sure. you know, all that kind of thing and sure. um, just coming as you are and, and so on. So I, um, we eventually just left the Presbyterian church, literally mm. quit packed up our van and just started traveling and eventually we ended up at a, a vineyard church mm. locally here where I live now near St. John, New Brunswick, Canada. And um, after a year, the pastor uh, left and asked me to take over and lo and behold, 1995, 96 rather, I became the pastor of a vineyard church and uh, we were there until I, I left the ministry in 2010. Wow. So yeah, that's a, that's a, my story in a nutshell. So I've been around. Oh, for I sure. I my own ecumenical movement, eh? Because I'm pretty much. I even had a Roman Catholic spiritual director. So I've been. <laughs> yeah, I've been around. No, that, that's cool. I yeah. mean, we'll we'll probably touch on all of those stages throughout the interview. You know, so I'll just start off with this though. You know, when when did you get into drawing though? Like, what was the first oh. memory you had of yourself as an artist? Yeah. Well very very young my dad was a, a painter an artist and um so when uh i say i tell this story at the very beginning of my book questions are the answer right um where i'm i remember myself sitting on a floor and we were to draw a bible a picture from the bible and i i drew a picture of um <clears throat> the Egyptian army, the soldiers and horses drowning in the Red Sea, and uh, <laughs> yes. I remember I remember it very well. But I also remember the looks on my teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I love that story. That's why I wanted you to share it. <laughs> yeah, this poor little disturbed child, you know, with such violent tendency. <laughs> or you're just being honest with what the Bible says. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I I I like drawing what I saw in my head, and um, right. I couldn't lie in a, in a sense I, I i i drew what i saw and you know the bible talks about all right. these you know the soldiers and horses drowning in the red sea and <laughs> and uh so i drew it and anyway that was my first memory of drawing something it was also my first memory of uh, me feeling the urge to draw what i saw or say what i saw <clears throat> but at the same time being um questioned about it or being you know uh scrutinized or judged for it so yeah. lo and behold here i am uh you know going on my 58th birthday and i still feel the same feelings <laughs> oh it's all good so even yeah. at that young age when you were drawing you know the stories in the bible and the way you saw it in your mind was, was it something that you became aware of that it seemed kind of troubling to you like all the violence happening or that just didn't cross your mind no, no, it didn't cross my mind. Yeah. I, I was, you know, I just, I just threw what I saw, and I was just a kid, yeah. And uh, <laughs> but I, I felt, you know, I often had people say, "Oh, you can't draw it that way. You got to draw it that way." And it was like, <laughs> oh, you know, this is the way I see it. Sorry. <laughs> this is my style, and and it's, you know, I often with my cartoons today, I, I get the same reactions from people. Yeah, too graphic, too honest, too, right. you know, whatever, um, too disturbing. Yeah, and I'm like, eh, you know. Right. I, I'm drawing what I see, but and if you you can't handle it, then um, you know, go to the Disney Channel. <laughs> right. No, no, and that's what I like about your your drawings. You know, your cartoons. You just you just draw it the way you see it, whether people want to agree with it or not. This is mm -hmm. how you see it. So how else would you want to draw it? You know, if you want to be honest with yourself. You know. Yeah. Um. You know, I love the title of your new book. Questions are the answers, and and like you, I love to ask questions. And in the beginning yeah. of your book. You know, you have a cartoon, like you have a character who's struggling with two thoughts, you know, where one thought would be, you know, keep my intellectual integrity or just believe, you know, right. what, what's behind that cartoon? Why did you draw that? Well, because um, belief, uh, I'm very fascinated by belief and, uh, you know, we're often, well, not often, we are taught what to believe. We develop beliefs. Um, and so... I, in my own life, I experienced that tension of needing to adopt certain beliefs in order to belong. But hmm. then, you know, I would struggle because that's not what I thought was true. Right. But, you know, you, you kind of have to, in order to belong, and that is the huge 
uh, gravitational pull of any religion or community. It's the struggle to belong and, um, uh, and even society. Yeah. And so we're, 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 it's sort of, we're forced to need, we're, we're forced to adopt certain beliefs and, and, you know, that, that, that gravitational pull is very strong in the church that you, you have to adopt certain beliefs in order to be a part of the community right. and, uh, you know, a valid, legitimate part of the community. But uh, a lot of people, and I know this for a fact, starting with my own observation of myself, my own experience, as well as the experience of many people I talk with, is that they're, they live kind of a schizophrenic life where they, hmm. they believe one thing and think another. Right, right. So that's the tension I wanted to try to graphically portray. Hmm. Yeah. No, right on with that. I mean, I, I totally feel you with that. There, t- growing up myself as a religious person, I, I did struggle with the with the things that I would say that I believe, because uh, everyone else is teaching it. It's the the doctrine of my denomination, you know. And then the stuff that right. I would feel inside my heart, but then just kind of brush it aside and be like, ah, oh, you know, I must, I'm probably wrong, <laughs> you know, because yeah. the Bible's right, or these people who are anointed, um, they probably hear God better than I do. You know, yeah. and so I, I totally feel that just having to, you know, belong with everybody. I mean, especially when you're young, you yeah. know, and so I, I, I totally understand that struggle, which was like, I felt this big, this big disconnect, as you said, with just with my head and my heart and just like, how do you make sense of this? And and even if at that time when I was a kid, it didn't make sense to me, I would just tell myself it'll eventually make sense or it's just, it's just a mystery. You know, that's just the way God is. Well, yeah, and there's a lot of scripture that's used to, um, and uh, you know, entrench that schizophrenic, yeah, almost, almost um, uh, not bipolar. What's the word I'm looking for? Bi- binary way of mm. of living, um, where you believe one thing but think another. Uh, mm. So, like, you know, when I would express my 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 doubts or questions to people in authority, they'd say, "Well, lean not in your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge Him." Yeah. In other words, don't trust your intellect. You need yeah. to believe. Or Paul's rants against the wisdom of this age, and yeah. you know, um, all this kind of thing, mm. where you know people live in absolute torment because they think one thing, and believe another, but then the scriptures say. Well, abandon the abandon your brain. Forget forget your thoughts. Yeah. Don't don't trust those. Just believe. Yeah. And we know what many dangerous, terrible, sad roads that can go down. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You know. Just like you, I've been to a lot of different denominations. I mean, I grew up um, in an Assemblies of God. I I became a pastor at a Southern Baptist church. I even served as a teacher at, at in a Presbyterian church. Wow. And so, you know, I was even involved in the whole Word of Faith movement, like a lot yeah. back then. With the whole, and then I even helped out the Vineyard at one point. I was an actual member, uh, in a sense. You know, um, I would go there every Sunday night, and I was really good friends with the leaders, some of the leaders. I even did some mission trips with them. You know, wow. so I, I I always tell people too, like I've been around and I've seen kind of like the differences, and especially growing up uh, Pentecostal. Um, of, of course, it's not every Pentecostal is like this, but in my time when I was going to church. It was downplayed, you know, the mind, you know, just just believe, stop using your intellect. And and yeah. I would get that a lot, you know, just like they were just telling me not to make, you know, ask so many questions. And so I found that so disturbing, you know, for yeah. myself when I started to uh, study the Bible more and um, eventually went to Bible school, just like how you did in your, in your book you were mentioning. And so, you know, I, I totally feel that. And, you know, so. You know, when people usually go to church, they want answers, you know, but, but to you, questions seem like they're more important, you know, but what, what good can questions do for a person that answers can't? Well, you know, I, I talk about, uh, in the book, it's basically cut up into three sections. So the first section, I, do, I talk about what I noticed in my own life, sort of a, a three stages of questioning. So the first stage of questions is, is closed questions, and we know we all know what a closed question right. is. That's a question that requires a yes or no answer. That's the only possible answer. So, yeah. let's yeah. take for example: <clears throat> is the Bible the inspired word of God? Yes or no? <laughs> so that's a, 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 and the reason I'm using this as an example was that's the first um, uh, Jenga block that was removed from my tower of belief that mm. really started my whole system shaking. 
sure. um, was the inspiration of scripture. Yeah. And and so the closed question would be: Is is word is the Bible the inspired word of God? Yes or no? And then the next stage is the swinging question. Um, it's sort of the door analogy. So the swinging or hinged question. Well, is it or isn't it? What does it mean to be inspired? Mm. What what you know does inspired mean that the ideas transmitted, or does it mean that the um, words are actually transmitted, and right. uh, can the story be inspired without it having being based in historical fact? You know, this is all kind of the swinging question where it's gray gray areas have been introduced into the the closed question world. So it's no longer black and white. It's kind of there's some gray areas you're not sure. And then finally, the the final the final um, uh, stage of questioning is open question, where there's 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 no yes or no answer. It's it's a, an, an embracing of the possibility. So it might be an open question. Might be well, what what value does the Bible have? What what is what does this mean? Uh, are there other scriptures that are similar? You know, and so we open the door to mystery. And the thing about this stage is that it doesn't really require an answer. You're you're comfortable um, embracing the the mystery or the paradox and uh, you're, you're no longer feeling the angst of needing to know mm -hmm. what the answer is. You're at peace. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's why I encourage people yeah. to start questioning, start somewhere and see where it leads you. Yeah. And you know, I mean, just like if someone were to be a critic though, do you think it would just be a cop out just to say, okay, why well, I'm asking you all these questions, David, you're not giving me any answers, you know? And then uh, like how, how would somebody be able to have, like a sense of security in this life if they just don't know anymore you know it's just always a mystery like oh i don't even know what's going to happen to me when i die now because i just don't know anymore <laughs> you know so so how can somebody live a life filled with a sense of hope if it's just all questions you know what i'm saying well be, um see i yeah i totally i totally get what you're saying because i totally was there i mean it's a life full of fear and um uh, where we we need to know what's going to happen when we die. We need to know where our loved ones are. We you know we need to know we need to feel like our feet is on something solid <coughs> or on something solid. You know, a, a yeah. firm foundation. But uh, my as if you if you read the whole book, questions are the answer. You can tell that my life, uh, my theological life, was full of anguish and searching and hmm. terrible fear and uh, doubts and. Uh, you know all that goes with it, and the and the thing, the surprising thing is, when I I came to a place of peace, there wasn't there wasn't any answer given. There was no answer that I could you know lay my yeah. bet down on. Right. It was the peace came uh, aside from an answer, right. uh, aside from the question. So it's a it was a very interesting journey. Yeah. So that you know. Um, that's, I, that's I kind of the irony of it all, though, right? Because it's like people think the peace comes from when you have all the answers, but yours came from kind of embracing the fact that you don't need to know all the answers. That's right. You know, and I found that to be a, a very beautiful thing because I was sharing your, your story with my wife yesterday when we were in the car, and I was telling her about how, like, you went through a lot. I, I, didn't, I didn't know anything about this stuff before. I just kind of know your drawings, you know. Yeah. So to read your story, I'm like, you know, I, I didn't realize how this – David guy's a pretty smart guy, <laughs> you know, like your education and you studied under Gordon Fee, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so I didn't even know that. And I was just um, really impressed about, you know, the stages of your life. And, and I really felt like, in a, I was telling my wife, like, oh, some of his story was so sad, but it's like, I could relate to that, you yeah. know, because that's just something that your, your story can speak for like so many people who have left the, the institutional church, you know, or. Or are struggling to stay. Yeah. Or exactly. That's, yeah. That's, that's my hope. That's my hope actually is that in telling my story and that I've come to a place of peace of mind, genuine peace of mind that hasn't gone away. Yeah. That uh, it'll validate the journey of other, the journeys of other right. people. That's what I'm really hoping. Especially because you do go through all these stages where, where people can relate, where you were a pastor preaching and struggling with the stuff that you're sharing, <laughs> you know, even whether or not you even believe it. And then the part where you leave the church mm -hmm. and 
uh, you know, that's where my wife was saying, you know, was there a good part to the story? And I was like, yeah, it's, it's when he was, you know, he found peace through it all in that <laughs> sense. And, uh, you know, but I was just sharing it because it, it can be a painful process. And, yeah. and it was a painful process even for me. Even I have my moments still, you know, being kind of, you know, away from the, the scene. Because just like you, in a sense, my whole life was dedicated to this stuff. You know, I, I, I spent so much money <laughs> on my theological education, training right. to be a pastor, training to eventually become a Christian apologist, believe it or not, you know, and then just having my whole world change, just like you, where mm -hmm. your your struggle came when you started questioning the Bible. And for me, that was the same, you yeah. know, because for most of my life, you, you know, I already had my master's degree. I already became a missionary to the Philippines. And my biggest struggle, like the, the issue that I just couldn't let go of was the the reliability of the Bible, if it was an error, that was the one thing I just couldn't let go of for all these years. Yeah. And I remember like I would have days where I would be questioning it, you know, the, the reliability of it all. And, and then for days I'd be struggling with it and I'd be like, nah, I can't let go of inerrancy because that's going to totally mess up the way I think about everything. Cause my whole life's based on that. You know, it's the way I live supposedly, you know, morally, you know, ethically, the, you know, my views of the afterlife and my view of God. And so for me to let go of, of that would change everything. And, and just like you, once I let go of inerrancy, there were just this whole domino effect going on, you know, where, OK, I let this one go. That means I could possibly let this other idea go, you know, which was scary because my whole life was built upon that. Well, yeah. I think I think that's the thing people intuitively know. If yeah. if they let go of one one belief, then everything starts to crumble. Yeah, people are we're smart. We intuitively know when we're in danger. Yeah, and we can smell uh, an earthquake before it happens uh, yeah. theologically. And I think that's why a lot of people, you know, are. Uh, I think that's why we become more and more dogmatic is uh, we're afraid to let go of these things that uh, if we did let go of them, then everything falls under question. Yeah. And your wife's, your wife's question is, is totally valid. Does this have a happy ending? Yeah. You know, and it does. Yeah. I absolutely testify. I was in the ministry for 30 years. I was in theological training for longer than that. I researched my ass off. Excuse yeah. me. Oh, no, and, you don't have to excuse me. But uh, <laughs> like, and I... I was in I was in theological anguish. I would say I was in complete anguish. And then in one night, it just all re was released, and peace of mind came. And the odd thing is, you'd think that one didn't have anything to do with the other. I don't know how they're related, but I know they are. But I know the the peace of mind that came did not come through propositional truth. Right. It came through um, just peace, knowing that everything is okay loving what actually is no longer trusting my thoughts no longer believing my beliefs um uh you know knowing that there if what you know our ideas and our words and our beliefs what's beyond that is there something beyond that because the word is not the thing yeah and and uh so and so the thing is, we I think words are important. Language obviously is important. Ideas are important. We need them. They're necessary. But at the same time, they they fall short of getting us to the peace of mind that we seek. Mm. But the peace of mind is there for those who seek it right, and for right. those who want it. Yeah. But it's not going to be by hanging on to our fundamental beliefs. Right, right. Yeah. I think the the biggest loss for a lot of people... Uh, including myself and, and in a sense I guess you could probably relate to this too is like a sense of community though that oh, you yeah. lose and and that was for me because you even talked about how you were trying to struggle to be normal again you know once you yeah. left the church and stuff and and I always felt like 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 I'm okay so like all a lot of these beliefs are shifting for me I had my moments here and there where I'd be struggling a little bit just knowing that I was possibly wrong all these years and but it was mm -hmm. a sense of community that was a big part for me and Mm -hmm. uh, just just thinking about how, you know, uh, my wife and I, when we share our story with other people, because, you know, they get surprised with where we're at, too, you know, because yeah. where we came from, my wife was like the, the poster child for like the goody Christian girl, <laughs> you know, yeah. she, one of the biggest churches in the Middle East where she grew up. And I would just, um, we would tell people like, no, we're, we're actually doing pretty good. And, and we don't even deny uh, a lot of the experiences that we we've had growing up we just probably interpret them a little bit differently now 
you know, and just even like the, you know, we were talking about the vineyard last night because like I said, I was, I was really good friends with some of the, the, the leaders there, the main ones that were like the prophetic ministry and all right. that. And like, they were the main prophetic people of like Anaheim, you know, if you're familiar with Anaheim branch oh, yeah. and, uh, yeah. you know, so I would, I would go there every Sunday and I would meet up with some of them at their houses and, and I would tell my wife, I said, you know, that, that's one of the things why I still believe in, in, you know, like, like healing and all that. Cause I, I've seen it, you know, I, I probably would interpret them a lot differently than my Pentecostal days. Mm-hmm. You know, but um, th- these experiences that we have are, are are real, and which is why, you know, I still hold on to, um, like certain ideas. You know, I di- I didn't let go of everything. I remember when, uh, like one of the I w- I won't mention this person's name, but th- this is a fairly well known preacher and teacher, mm-hmm. and they started seeing some of my stuff on Facebook, um, like several years ago, and they were getting concerned. And they were very supportive of me back then, but now they were getting concerned. And uh, yeah. and then this person came to America. This is person from out of the country, and then they wanted to talk to me on the phone. I was like, sure. And then they were they just wanted to tell me how they were troubled by some of my my beliefs that I was putting out there. And and I was just telling them about how it, it really started with my understanding of the Bible. And then you know, surprisingly, I was you know I was sharing to this person my thoughts about it and it was making sense to him but he said you know josh i just i don't know like yeah but i just can't go there i just can't i just can't let go of the bible and so i I even saw how that could put someone in a rough place because here's a well-known preacher uh speaker traveling and you get paid to teach from this book that you're telling people it's 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 true 100 percent true yeah And, and you know that that's another tough thing is like when you start questioning, you know, you 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 could possibly lose your your income, <laughs> you know. Yeah. This is how people know you, you know. You're teaching from the Bible and stuff, and yeah. And it's funny because I still get a lot of comments every day, both negative and positive, for like my videos that I put out, and they they watch a lot of my old stuff still, which is interesting. And I'm just like, oh, Rem, it's like they have no idea of the stuff that I put out nowadays, you know. And and sometimes like people would want to support me find you know financially to you know speak somewhere and then when they hear my new stuff they don't want me to come anymore yeah. you know so i've seen how that's affected our own lives you know and uh, but you know anyway you know in, in one of your cartoons you know you have a you have a picture of a library like of all the theological disagreements and there were yeah. like a lot of books in there you know so you talk about how you saw things very black and white back then you know so yeah. How did questions affect your very, like you said, you had a very structured world, though. You know, so how did it affect you, though, in that sense? Well, I, um, it began, I, uh, I, I did live in a very structured world, a uh, very theologically correct world. Uh, well, according to me, it was correct. <laughs> and, um, you know, did all my research, you know, graduated summa cum laude and, and uh, you know, just... I did all the work, and but it was. I read a book at one point just before I was graduating for my master's um, New Testament studies, and um, it was called "The Silence of Jesus" by James Breach. And I don't know why I read the book uh, because I'm sure it wasn't on the syllabi of any of my courses. But I read the book, and it rocked my world. Like it, mm. it, it sort of challenged the gospels accounts of the sayings of Jesus and which ones are um, uh, authentic and which ones aren't and so on. Anyway, yeah. long story short, my that's when my theological world really started crumbling. And, uh, you know, I could tell, but I, I hung on for many, many years after that. Like I, I tried to figure out ways to in, integrate, you know, or, compromise or bend or you know all the things we do theologically to hold on to as much as we can yeah but then um as as time went on i i began feeling the need for me to be honest with myself and um when i started the blog naked pastor back in 2005 or 6 i i don't know i just have uh this drive to be authentic mm-hmm. with people and honest and vulnerable and so i started writing about my you know my what i was going through naked pastor right and um Mm. so i had these two things going on where i was being challenged within uh theologically 
and where I needed to sort of vent, hmm. be honest with people about where I was. Now, at first, nobody cared. Like people, you know, hither, hither and yon would read my blog, but my own congregation didn't. They were like, we have to listen to you every week. Why would we want to listen to you every day? <laughs> so, you know, I, I pretty went pretty well continued in obscurity for a long time until uh, in 2009 when I had a very dramatic spiritual experience and like I said like where I I got this peace of mind and everything and I started writing about that and being even more honest and and then other people started noticing and talking to people in my congregation and that was the beginning of the end for me hmm. as a, as a pastor was that the when you had that dream yeah yeah, do you mind sharing about that, Drew? No, I don't mind sharing. Um, I, I, you know, this my next project is is trying to write and articulate that, which is very very difficult for me oh. to do. But the the dream itself was I was at the bottom of a huge waterfall, similar to like Niagara Falls, and um, looking up, and I could see these, you know, this huge, you know, just like gallons upon gallons of water pouring over the lip of the the rim of the canyon. Uh, the, the cliff right so over top of the the rim um i can't see what's there but i know it's immense infinite hmm. uh unlimited source and um then coming over the rim is this huge amount of water that you know crashes on the ground finally and spreads throughout the the earth this is what i see in my dream but in the dream, I knew what I was seeing was sort of a metaphor for what is. Hmm. Um, and theologically, I knew from whatever perspective we are standing, no matter who we are, what our religion is or non-religion is or whatever, um, that we are all seeing the same thing, but we're all perceiving it through our own paradigms and worldviews. Hmm trying to understand it within our own selves and then trying to articulate it with our own unique languages. But it's all the same thing. It's what is. It's reality. Reality rules over all of our experiences and, and impressions and articulations. So I knew as a Christian, if a Christian was looking at this picture, they would see above the rim would be God, unlimited source, infinite source. And what's the revelation of that is Jesus, the incarnation, you know, hmm. um, making himself known. And then the Holy Spirit is where it spreads throughout and has an effect on the earth. Right. And, you know, that. but I also knew that it could mean the same thing for a Buddhist, a Jew, a Muslim, uh, an atheist. No matter who we are, there's always something that we do not know and understand that we call mystery. It's the undiscovered. Right. Then it's it's the next is it making itself known right. and the discovery and then its application on, on the earth and the human race. So mm. that when I woke up, it was like that theological anguish I'd been experiencing for most of my life was gone and peace of mind was there instead. And it hasn't gone away. <laughs> People yeah. might say, you're living in denial. You're living in denial. But <laughs> no, it's not. I, I still do my studies and research and writing yeah. and still fully engaged intellectually, mentally, um, you know, but uh, that peace of mind is there. The, the anguish is gone. Yeah. So, yeah, that that's, was the turning point in my life. And I started yes. to care about that. And I'd have people in my own congregation coming up to me and saying, what's this we hear that you wrote about that you don't believe in God anymore? And, and you know, I knew. <laughs> I knew that my time was up. So. Yeah, yeah. No, so I guess with that dream came this like greater awareness, you know, and then you, I guess you ended up having more more patience for other people who had different views than you then, you know, uh, just understanding that this is all a journey for everybody. And I even like, and I was even surprised to see you quote The Holographic Universe because I love that book. You know, oh, yeah. uh, I was like, what? You know, so I was like just surprised to read that because, you know, I, I even like sharing about that stuff a lot and talking about perception and how we see things. And so, um, you know, we're all trying to figure this out, you know, but one of the things mm. I would like you to touch on sure. uh, just because there's a I get a lot of messages from people who are struggling still. So I like the fact that you had this greater awareness. But can you just talk about that time uh, when you went through that dark period in your life? You know, because when you there was a time when you had no peace. You know, oh, do you, yeah. Do you mind so, just sharing that so people could kind of identify? 
Okay, sure, absolutely. I'd love to. Um, I love telling this story because I know a lot of people identify it and they're in the closet about it because it's a very frightening yeah. thing and they know um, that if they are open about it, they're going to ostracize themselves yeah. and um, from their communities. Yeah. And uh, I'm totally aware of that. So I do want to share it. So, yeah, the the the... the intellectual piece that whatever you want to call it, I don't know what sure what to call it but the peace of mind came but uh, now so, so then it wasn't long after that that I, I knew my time was up the church and I agreed that we were no longer compatible mm. and we went our separate ways it was an amicable divorce mm. and um, so for the next year um, you know I I, I, I had a severance package. There was employment insurance involved and so on. But I got a job as a uh, teaching at a university, teaching English as a second language to international students. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for that first year, uh, well, like the first Sunday after I quit, I went for a walk on a Sunday morning, which I never, I hadn't done in so many years. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I went for a walk on a Sunday morning and it was the strangest feeling. Like I was kind of, this was really delicious like, <laughs> it's your day off finally on a Sunday <laughs> yeah I was just totally enjoying this walk and people were driving by in their cars dressed up and I knew they were going to church and was kind of like ah sucks to be you <laughs> but uh, you know that's the way I, I felt at the time but also looking back I realized now that I was I was kind of numb like oh, uh, right, right. you know you don't just cold turkey an addiction like that and yeah. over it in a few days like so <laughs> I was totally not prepared for what lay ahead so uh, you know it was like a couple of years later when my wife finally insisted I see somebody get, a, get a counselor because I was in trouble I was I was numb I was in you know it's one thing to be at peace of mind theologically yeah. uh, it yet had to work its way out into my exterior world because yeah. I was deconstructing I was I was coming down I was coming off a very heavy addiction I was trying to figure out how to be a human being in the world and at the time you know, it was kind of like the perfect storm. Lisa and I went bankrupt, uh, mm -hmm. personally bankrupt. Our kids had left home, mm -hmm. uh, so we were empty nesting. She'd gone back to university to study for her nursing. Um, you know, I'd, I'd quit my job. I'd left my vocation, left my career, <clears throat> left my paycheck. You know, we left our community and friends. Uh, mm -hmm. It was like the perfect storm. And mm -hmm. It was a horrible dark time where we trying to figure out how to be human beings again, you know, and it was, uh, you know, it was hard losing, losing my friends as a minister yeah. or a pastor, clergy, losing their career, their vocation. It's absolutely bone chillingly terrifying because, you know, we don't, we're not trained to do anything else, but yeah. theological stuff. And so, yeah, it was a very, very dark time. But what saved me was, well, my wife. Uh, of course, um, who's, you know, a saint. And um, I, I did take her advice and found a therapist that I could talk with. And I found some people. Um, I, I do have a few good local friends. And um, I started The Lasting Supper, and they became my, my community. So, yeah, I, uh, I, I just tweeted last night and put it on Facebook, too. If you can at all help it, do not deconstruct alone. And I, I totally, totally recommend that because it's grueling. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can you tell us more about the whole Lasting Supper thing? Yeah, sure. In 2012, I um, was feeling uh, lonely. And I knew there were a lot of people out there like me, deconstructing, um, looking for companionship and so on. But I also still have this pastoral drive in me to help people. And um, so I, I thought, well, let, I'm going to provide resources for people who are deconstructing or trying to reconstruct their lives, who want to be independent, um, who want to experience personal transformation um, outside of the realms of authority or control or institution or organization and so on. So I started the, the website, um, The Lasting Supper. Nice. And so it's an online community. Um, I interview members uh, just for the members to listen to where we can be honest about our journeys. Uh, I write letters every week hopefully instructional, helpful letters um, to help us with our D and reconstruction. Hmm. And we have a chat room. We have a, a secret Facebook group and uh, all kinds of stuff that, uh, and, and forums as well. <clears throat> so 
we keep these things going to just provide not only resources but fellowship for people who are going through this yeah. very, very difficult time. And people are finding uh, their tribe too, like they're yeah. finding people who are on the same page and are you know um, make good friends and they have meetups here and there and yeah. yeah, it's really cool. Nice. So how often are your your meetups? Well, no, um, they're uh, spontaneous. Oh, it's like kind of random people connecting. Yeah, random people okay. who are lasting supper people who meet up in a certain city or, yeah. or, or whatever so no, uh, i'd cool. love to have a like a you know for us all to go to a really cool retreat center or something yeah. and hang out it would be really awesome because they're an amazing bunch of people no that, that sounds awesome i mean that sounds really encouraging you know because even for me for, you know just being able to do some deconstruction myself sometimes i did feel alone you know because like oh, my, yeah. my circle of friends uh, to be honest, a lot of them, they're not into theology, <laughs> you yeah. know, so so here they are, you know, they're all churchgoers and stuff. And then here's me, you know, doing my own thing and studying and, and having my own beliefs challenge. And then when I meet up with them, it's like, I want to talk about this stuff with them. But then it's just that's not their stuff. You know, they, they're, no. they're a lot of them. They're just very uh, just simple people, you know, who go to church and have their faith. And so when I started to. Uh, read a lot of the the so-called liberal people that it, it was tough for me you know yeah. I did I did feel alone uh, many times where I would just just talk to my wife you know and I could just tell her because um I just didn't even know who I could talk to about this stuff because it's gonna scare them you know yeah. or, or they'd be afraid of me I, I just even attended um, a wedding just like two two three weeks ago and it was from a church who I found out they were concerned about me and and then at the end of the so i felt a little bit uncomfortable because i could see some of their faces when they greet me it looks it looks <laughs> kind of funny but then you know but i'm like pretty chill like it doesn't bother me too much but then at the very end some like at the very end of the wedding some guy just comes up to me randomly be like hey josh i heard i heard some stuff about you man <laughs> like i heard you know someone told me that you went off the deep end man but i i totally get where you're coming from man and then they were telling me all the <laughs> names of the guys that they were listening to and like i had no idea this guy was listening to to some of my stuff and and to some of the guys that I even read and listen you know listen to yeah. so yeah. and just kind of felt nice to have somebody just kind of tell you like hey you know I I, I get what you're saying you know yeah. like like it's all good like for me I'm all good that people disagree with me because like I said I get negative stuff pretty much every day from people but mm -hmm. like I tell my wife I I can't always have that though like there's only so much I can take in a sense if just hearing all the negativity from people mm -hmm. telling me like I'm crazy or I'm going to hell. Like, ah, that's fine. But there, there comes a point where I need someone to tell me like, I'm okay. You know? Well, yeah, absolutely. Like, and I totally, I totally agree with that. And, and you know, in my business, I, I get it a lot too. I get a lot of negative stuff. I get a lot of pity. Yeah. Um, you know, I get a lot of concern, but you know, I get, I get some really, really strong support. Like yeah. people who write letters just saying how, helpful we've been or whatever <clears throat> so you know and the, and the thing about the lasting supper is i want to make this clear is i am very very passionate about personal freedom and yeah. people traveling at their own pace and being who they are i don't care where people end up right. i've helped people become good atheists i've helped right. people become excellent agnostics i've helped people become better believers like right. uh, i've helped people who've left the ministry go back in I've helped people who are in the ministry leave the ministry. So for me, the, the end product, the goal is your personal freedom and your independence and your own personal transformation. Yeah. It, so that's why in the Lasting Supper, we have a wide diversity of people, everywhere from church-going believers to, you know, uh, atheists who will never darken the door of any religious institution ever again in their life. So, you know, and we got everybody in between. And the, the commonality is mutual respect for one another's journeys because none of us have arrived. We're all in process and we're all discovering how to be ourselves. And yeah. that's what I delight in. That's what I think is awesome. Yeah. If you're given the space to uh, be yourself, then you'll be yourself. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I love that. You know, like, like just like you, I, I respect, you know, other people wherever they're at. Um, even if they are an atheist, I remember when I spoke, um, out of state and then one of the speakers comes up to me and like one of the first thing this guy says is like, Hey Josh, I just came from somewhere. And a guy was telling me how <clears throat> he became an atheist through your teachings. I was like, Oh, cool. <laughs> you know, and I, you know what I mean? Like, and not to say that atheism is just the, the right 
way to go. I'm just saying, like, if it makes you a better person, you know, mm. because you could be a Christian and you could be an asshole, you know. So it's like, like, of course, I have some disagreements with, with pretty much everybody, you know, because, like, we never agree with everything another person says. But if if, it, if that's where they're at on their journey and it's making you a better person, then then why not just respect them with wherever they're at? You well, know? well, the thing and the dream really drove this home for me um, was I we're all one. I really deeply know that we are all one and connected at a very deep yeah. and fundamental level. And that it's only our thoughts that seem to separate us. So if I'm talking to an atheist or a, a believer or an agnostic or a Jew or a Muslim or a Buddhist or whatever, we're talking, we're using our own language and everything, but it's only our thoughts and our beliefs that seem to separate us. It's yeah. not real. Yeah. So, you know, that's why I, I do have respect for every everybody and the and yeah. love for everybody and their position and you know when when it when it gets dangerous and we're seeing it in the world is when we become fundamentalist about it and exclusive and right. want to kill everybody else right you know, right no and I, and I guess that's we could even talk about your your gandhi phase <laughs> that your wife oh, talked yeah. about you know so you're kind of like embracing like a like a paradoxical universe can you talk about that a little bit of what happened during that phase because I, I found that pretty cool that you're reading certain you know eastern philosophy <laughs> oh yeah well that was another uh, experience I, I tell about in the book where i was basically um unkind to a street person who needed food mm, yeah and uh i was a minister at the time yeah assistant minister that's a powerful I, story by the way i wanted you uh, to share that too so that's good oh you did yeah i was about to ask you that <laughs> <laughs> no but i'll tell yeah the, it was a snowy day and i was in the church and it was about time to go home and there was a big snowstorm coming and and it had started and i knew if i didn't get in my car and get home i was going to be stuck hmm. and this street person came in and wanted food and i was and i could smell the alcohol in his breath and i rushed him out the door basically told him come back sober and we'll talk business yeah. and you know it was uh i was mean and i was like in a hurry and i didn't care you know now that in and of itself is you know we everybody does that all the time we yeah. walk by people in need and maybe we're not as mean as i was where we just say you know sober up and i'll help you but yeah. you know looking back now i'm that's a horrible horrible story to recount but when he was leaving and he was going down the steps without any food for me um he looked back up at me and he said you'll never be a minister the way you treated me today hmm. just and uh just as sober as a stone too and hmm. it it pierced me right through to my heart and i knew and you know up to this point i'd been living such a perfect life you know what i mean like yeah. i was minister i was working hard i was having success with the youth group i was a teacher and i was you know i was doing all doing it all right and you know t time scheduling my day and i was like had my act together but then i realized i didn't have my shit together so yeah. i was like yeah. i was totally bankrupt morally and spiritually and i crashed that weekend i really did and thank god i was snowbound hmm. uh, in canada that means so much snow that you're bound to the house you can't leave yeah, so yeah. fortunately we were <clears throat> i was stuck at home for the weekend but i came across a book which is another kind of serendipitous story but i came across a book by henry Nowen in my library <laughs> and that turned me on to thomas merton and that turned me on to my feeling the need to find a spiritual director and um the spiritual director who was a uh a nun who was the abbess of her monastery <laughs> Uh, she spiritual uh, directed me for many, many months, maybe even a couple of years. Anyway, she turned me on to Eastern thought, you know, and um, I was reading Gandhi and Buddhism and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, my wife calls it the Gandhi phase because I <laughs> I stopped showering and <laughs> I, I, oh, had okay. one, I had one set of clothes and, <laughs> You know, I, I no, I didn't. Stop oh, shopping. you are the naked pastor. No, <laughs> yeah, I, I had one set of clothes. I I didn't stop showering. I stopped using <laughs> chemicals like no soap and nothing. Like I I just you know ate vegetables only, That's funny. and uh, I just really kind of 
got weird and uh, <laughs> ate it a lot every day. And because this this was just another expression of my theological angst, right? Trying to find mm. this peace of mind that would continually eluded me. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I even went through a phase where I wanted to, I was wondering if I sh shouldn't have got married and, and should have become a hermit. Of course, that, <laughs> that didn't help my marriage very much. <laughs> right, right, right. We moved on. <laughs> no, no, it's all good, man. You know? <laughs> no, that's cool. You know, um, there, was one, there was one cartoon where you had like a theology book. I don't know if you want to call it like a human theology book because it had legs and stuff. So, and the, the book was being restrained, you know. And so, so how, in your opinion, how does theology hurt people? Oh well, man. Yeah, theology. Uh, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, theology, in my opinion, a lot of the theology that we hear in the churches today is uh, a means to control people, mm -hmm. to keep keep us in line, um, keep us behaving. Um, so you know, it holds out in front of us the reward of eternal life and heaven. It holds out in front of us or over our heads, the fear of eternal torment and hell, yeah. you know, um, it's just, uh, a, a lot of it is the language of control and, uh, you know, not all of it. Sure. I love theology. Yeah. Karl Barth is bar none and always will be my favorite theologian. <laughs> yeah. Um, but you know, uh, so there is good theology. There are good pastors. There are great churches. I've seen them. I've been a part of them. And so on, but a lot of a lot of theology, yeah. So that cartoon it shows theology book being bound yeah. in a stretcher, and the nurse says we had to constrain him because he was hurting too many people. <laughs> but it's true, like we we see theology hurting all kinds of people. Yeah, and um, you know, I I go after that online. That's what yeah. I, I I like to do graffiti on those kinds of uh, you know buildings. Nice, nice. Now, now since you're if you were kind of aware of these things, you know, like just the whole the language of fear and control and people preaching hell, but you were a pastor too, though. So, like, how what did your services look like? You know, did it have a typical, you know, sermon and worship? And not like, what did yeah. you make any changes? You know, with the with your structure. Well, yeah, like I I was a controlling pastor. I, I've been controlling. I've been abu I've, I've I've abused people spiritually. Sure. Um, Every you know, we've all have. <laughs> we all have. I think every pastor ought to admit there have been yeah. times that they have uh, abused somebody. Now, in my opinion, there's a difference between somebody who has abused some people once in a while and somebody who's abusive. Sure. Um, I think there's where it's habitual. Um, and uh, so, anyway, on on with the question. Um, yeah. So there there have been times when I've been you know controlling and trying to bend the congregation to my will and uh, trying to get them to jump onto my agenda and support it and get to, you know, fulfill my vision for what they should be and all that kind of thing. Um, you know, then around that time I started reading theologians like <clears throat> Eugene Peterson, hmm. who challenges that whole thing. Yeah. who was he heavily influenced by the American essayist and poet and novelist uh, Wendell Berry, who I also love, mm -hmm. who, you know, just talks about um, nurturing the soil, appreciating what is, loving what is, caring for what is, letting it go at its own pace and so on. And so, you know, uh, but then eventually, so I did the preachy thing and, and all that kind of stuff. But then <clears throat> when I came to the vineyard and really started accelerating my own personal transformation was starting to accelerate or maybe my own speed at, towards my own destruction was accelerating I don't know what you want to call mm -hmm. it but um, yeah I started opening up the service uh, letting other people lead and other people were leading worship um, and we started I started having discussions rather than monologues for my sermons yeah. I'd have Q and A. People were free to interrupt me. Um, we would. I, I found a lot more helpful uh, things occurred during discussions and Q and As than than me preaching a monologue. Yeah. And my leadership style with the leadership team, like we would, we started having what we called open round tables, where the leadership team would meet. Oh, oh now occasionally we had to meet privately because of certain issues, but hmm. <coughs> we would have what we called open round tables where we yeah. would meet and anybody could come. And join in, and uh, um, and so it became very sort of a 
flat democratic process <laughs> where the congregation was really seriously involved in its own welfare and um, became very self-determining. And it was powerful, man. Yeah. It really was powerful. No, it sounds cool. I, I mean, but did people, did it ever get out of hand? Like, you know, people... Oh, yeah, totally. Well, that's that's why a lot of people don't like to do it because it is, it does... It gets messy. It can be chaotic and it is messy. Yeah. It is messy. Um, rather than the pastor saying, no, this is how we're going to do things. He gets the leadership team to endorse it and on it goes. Um, to have this kind of democratic uh, thing happening was very the energy it would produce was powerful. Right. Yeah, it was messy, but that's it, life. <laughs> well, it was it was incredible. It was like an adventure. But yeah. then you know, there were some people who you know were influential who just liked church. They just wanted church. You know, they just <laughs> right, wanted right. the typical. You know, they they loved they loved the fellowship. The uh, um, authenticity of our fellowship uh, of the community and it was, it was really authentic yeah. and it was powerful but they just, you know, they missed the predictability some of the programs you know uh, um, growth, uh, yeah. influence you know, things like that things I totally get and understand and you know, and, and I was also because I was liberal towards my own theological growth uh, and and wanting space to continue growing, I uh, allowed that for others. So there was a great diversity of belief also represented in the congregation, which was disturbing for some people. Hmm. Um, you know, I found out people want to be told what to believe and how to behave, and uh, yeah. I couldn't do that for them anymore. Yeah. So how did that work out though? With like, because you know I've been to the vineyard a lot, but if someone were to just ask you any random question, you know, mm. what if they ask you something that your beliefs would be totally contradictory to what a lot of the vineyard leaders, you know, believe. Would you say it? Well, to be honest, like when when you are a pastor in a denomination, there is an enormous amount of pressure to right. conform and, and speak the language and tow the rope. Like I, I totally, totally get that. Now, the vineyard church is the congregations are pretty autonomous. Like they... Each individual church is pretty autonomous, but yeah. you know, eventually it 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 moves up the chain and um, the food chain, and you know, the higher ups eventually hear about what's going on, and you know, so that happened to me where eventually the um, those in authority over me were starting to express concern, huh. and um, I knew I knew when that happened also that my time was probably yeah. running short. Right. Yeah. So was that when you finally just said, that's it, I'm done? Was that the moment, like after the vineyard, when you said you're done with ministry, the church stuff, and then you yeah. and then you told your wife or something, like, I'm done, or something like that? Yeah. I Was it the I'm last? I'm with people in the church who, hmm. you know, have been very supportive, and we're still friends um, to this day, but it was a very difficult meeting where I knew as, as people kept talking. Yeah. That could be... Tough. I knew that my... I knew... I had lost the goodwill of the uh, their. I, I'd lost their goodwill yeah. to continue on as as uh, the spiritual leader or whatever you want to call me of that congregation, and I, I just <coughs> I'd been fighting and fighting and fighting to stay. I, I always struggled with my ordination anyway, but I knew this night. I knew when I left and walked home. I texted my wife. I said, honey, I'm done. She was at work. She texted back and said, yeah, me too. Hmm. And it was over. And within two weeks, I was replaced and I was gone. Hmm. Never, you know, happened very quickly. Yeah, yeah. So how is it, you know, like for people, because obviously like we get our critics and stuff, but, you know, mm -hmm. they'll, they'll criticize us for criticizing. So it's like, you know. I think you mentioned in your book, you know, how was it possible to criti <clears throat> to criticize something and to love it at the same time? You know, for example, the church. So it's like, you know, you have your cartoons, uh, your blog, and you're, you're, you're criticizing, but how can you tell someone, like, you love it at the same time? You know, because some people would be like, just stop criticizing, <laughs> you know, stop being judgmental. Yeah, it's know? interesting, because uh, um, I had lunch with somebody today who mentioned that one uh, person he knows was saying like, why doesn't he just leave? Like, why is he still <laughs> hanging on, you know, you know, uh, chomping on that bone? Yeah. And, and it's because I care about people who 
um, are still there. Like I, I, I want to help people. Um, mm -hmm. I want to help people evolve or progress or, uh, personal transformation. I, w I want to help people do that. So, you know, I have, I have, I know people who've left and they've left it behind and, you know, they've moved on to something totally different, but yeah. I keep going back cause, uh, into the church, so to speak online. Um, I keep going back cause I, I want to help as many people as I can. Those who are leaving and need, need help of some kind or those who are struggling mm -hmm. to stay or whatever. Like I, I really do care. And I understand that terrain. I know that terrain yeah. intimately. I know every, stone every pebble every blade of grass and pretty much and i i, I just want to help guide people if they want that or provide help or support or encouragement or yeah friends you know because the lasting supper does provide that so that's that's why and i do like i keep saying i i totally believe in community yeah. you and i both know what it's like not to have it it's very lonely and um so I, I believe in it, but can we please do it right? Can we please yeah. do it? Healthy, can we please do it in healthy ways that right. doesn't damage people or require them to compromise their integrity or their intellect or their values? Can can we can we gather together in ways that are mutually beneficial? Where you know my freedom, we can we can learn and experiment with and discover how I can be free while not violating the freedoms of others. Like that's to me yeah. the big question. Yeah. Can we do that? And <clears throat> so that's what I, 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 that's why I critique the church. I critique yeah. what I feel is unhealthy and unhelpful about it. Yeah. And um, because I believe in it, yeah. I believe you can do it right. I've seen it. Right. I've been part of community, and I've seen communities and visited communities that are, when it's done right, man. Yeah, yeah. It's beautiful. It's oh, beautiful. for sure. I know. I feel you on that. You know, like, and that that's one of the things. You know, I've seen your your stuff throughout the years, and. And I never really found any problems with it, you know, in, the, in that sense. I never found you, like, mean, <laughs> you know, or condescending. I found it very creative, to be honest. That's why it's like, you know, anyone can interpret your, your, your cartoons any way that they want, but it's very, you know, provocative. And mm. I like that, you know. And oh, I, I, I would even see some of the comments that are on your blog, and, and you came off, at least from what I've seen, respectful, <laughs> you know, from what I've seen. For the I try to be. <laughs> you know, uh, I'm sure we all have our moments, but I'm, I, I do appreciate your work. And, and I could totally feel where, uh, you know, for myself, I got to a point where I, I was just kind of tired of just talking about religion in the church and, you know, just the same old, same old. And, and then I actually went through a phase where I kind of just started reading like self-help books and started talking about, those kind of topics, you know, about motivation and following your dreams and all that. So I had ended up even writing a whole book on that. But then, yeah. uh, then eventually it just came to a point where like that, that, that religious stuff was still in me in the sense, I still get messages from people pretty much every day telling me their journey, but I'm not talking about that stuff online anymore, but I'm still getting these messages every day. And then my heart would always go to that, you know, be like, oh man, you know, I would tell my wife, like, I just, there's times I just want nothing to do with that world. You know, mm. because not because I'm bitter, but it's just I don't want to deal with that anymore because I'd rather talk about other stuff, <laughs> you know, instead of about religion and church and um, <clears throat> all those things. But then I told my wife, I said, you know, I feel like I just want to go back to it in a sense of which is why I started this podcast of um, it's it's my heart to help people who who are in these places of, uh, you know, letting go of their their long held religion and traditions. And because I've been there. And it was very painful and very lonely, you know, to be honest. And so that, that's one of the reasons why I'm, I'm still, you know, talking about it these days again. Because a lot of people notice I went silent about it for a while, you know. And Well, yeah, no, totally. I get it. Like, uh, there's been times when I, you know, when the Lasting Supper, it's a lot of work, man. It's really, yeah. really hard work. I, I enjoy it. I love it. I'm passionate about it. I believe in it. But, man, there's been times when it's been very painful and sure. just really, really hard, hard time-consuming work sure, but sure. and i'm like man i'm done like, <laughs> i'm so done like i i'm gonna go into just do art and yeah. i'm gonna start a i'm gonna start a forum for artists and you yeah. know blah 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 and, but then i i know deep down inside i would miss yeah I, right i i i love helping people with their personal transformations and yeah. i love uh reading philosophy and theology yeah. and you know how to be a, a moral person in this world, and and so yeah. like that's what I'm about. I, I just know it. I just know it deep down that yeah. I would wither up and die if I couldn't keep doing 
doing this stuff. So, yeah. hey, can I ask you a question? Maybe turn the table a bit. Oh, no. No. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So one of the big, big things I, um, one of the most difficult things for, for me and my deconstruction was uh, with my wife and I. Yeah. It was, it was tough at times, right? Because we, we used to be very much on the same page and our whole yeah. lives, we were very busy together yeah. doing the same thing on the same page theologically, yeah. uh, vocationally, because she was the pastor's wife, right, kind of thing. And <laughs> just so, so much. And then this started and she went into nursing and I'm doing this, you know, and uh, it, it was, our marriage went through a real major stretch. I mean, we're okay now. We're good now, actually. But, yeah. and it was, it was tough. And uh, sure. so, was it the same for you guys? Did you guys go through a tough stretch? You know, I'll be honest, like I, I could say I'm lucky. Uh, yeah. Because my wife never gave me problems, like not even once that I could even remember right now. I mean, I get I get messages from people telling me, uh, you know, their views change and then their wives would want to leave them. You know, I'm just like, oh, my gosh, you know, and yeah. but I'll be honest with you. I guess I could say I'm lucky in that sense. We never had issues. It's like when my wife met me in the Philippines. So so when she was part of the, the one of the biggest churches in the Middle East, because that's where she grew up, she went through that whole evangelical phase and she ended up moving to thailand uh, to study film and mm -hmm. so she was on her own for the first time and that's where she told me she started to kind of think for herself for the first time and she started to hear more about like the love and the grace of god emphasized more and then she, after thailand she met me when i was doing like my 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 grace stuff i used to preach grace 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 a lot you know back right. then and so when she met me she felt like a lot of the stuff that i was sharing confirmed um, what she was starting to believe, but then obviously that 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 grace. I mean, I still share the love, you know, love and grace and all that stuff. But it's like when I started getting more into the, uh, you know, studying liberal theology even more with mm -hmm. more of an open mind. Even when I went through that phase and started mm -hmm. questioning the doctrine of hell, she never gave me a problem. It's it's mm -hmm. it's it's crazy. But that's where, uh, like, even when I would tell some of my questions to her, it seemed like it was even easier for her to let go. Uh, some of these things because for me it was hard because i taught this stuff <laughs> for most of my adult life uh yeah. she didn't not so much you know so i think it was harder for me and i would share my heart and she would be like yeah that makes sense <laughs> you know like yeah. why would god do that why would god you know <laughs> let someone be in hell forever so you know and she she started like reading stuff like eastern philosophy and buddhism and and you know so she she was doing her own exploration at the same time and uh, yeah. So that, that's where I could say I'm I'm lucky in that. Situation. Yeah, no, that's that's cool. And 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 same with me. Like my my wife, she wasn't the problem. I I, I was the problem. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, for us it was um, being very much in the same world, so to speak. Yeah, sharing. We shared our lives totally, completely, and yeah, uh, and and then all of a sudden here we are, kind of more independent than we've ever been but yeah. that was a growth stage for us but it was sure. it was really good and really healthy yeah. hey i went to the philippines you know i went there on a i went and taught in a bible college in um you did manila yeah was it bbc uh it's a huge round mega church oh, can you remember like because uh, I, I just know some of the schools i don't remember how they look <laughs> yeah big round mega church pentecostal and uh, it might be BBC okay. satellite churches everywhere. It nice. sounds familiar. BBC, what was BBC stand the for? Bethel Bible College, I think so. Because yeah. that's and, one of the main, um, I guess you, I think it's like Assemblies of God or Pentecostal yeah. schools there in Manila. Because I went there yeah. one time, yeah. And, and then uh, I went over to Cebu and oh, stuff nice, while that's I was a nice there. Place. So, yeah, it was oh, awesome. Okay. They, and the Filipino people were amazing. Oh, yeah. Did you they, know we're moving back? Are you? Yeah, I'm moving back in a few months. <laughs> that's that's one of the reasons why I wanted to do a lot of these interviews before we head out because we gotta like pack our bags and find a brand new home and everything. So, Holy. um, we're we're we loved it over there, and you know I'm I'm trying to start my our lives over again over there in a different way where we're not gonna be labeled as missionaries as we were before. Uh -huh. I mean, it was tough, man, like living as a missionary to be honest, and especially yeah. when my my stuff was evolving my views and and i was publicly letting people see that you know because i would yeah. share something on youtube and people would see that so uh you know it was tough to be honest financially for us and yeah. you know but now we're going back we're we're doing something different and 
Um, but it's all good, you know. And, and and you know, I was looking through your Facebook the other day, and it was cool. Like you and your wife seem pretty cool, man. <laughs> seem pretty happy as you were. Yeah, we are me. very happy. Yeah, and, and and I I think that's really awesome just to have um a partner in our lives that could just understand us and oh, you know. Like- and I and I tell my wife for me, I tell my wife everything, like everything, you know, yep. whatever is on my mind, and I just feel, uh just safe you know yeah. telling her i don't feel afraid and i think that's where i'm just um i'm really happy about that but you know we'll, we'll come to a close so what, what's next for you man well i want to uh well i'm, I'm just really starting to promote this book now um yeah. by the time this is aired um it'll be released hopefully in all the stores in the states and canada too oh nice but i'm really hoping it'll help a lot of people um of course every author wants their book to sell but i i really want it to get into the hands of a lot of people because i'm hoping that through the telling of my story and that it does have a happy ending that it'll validate the journey of other people so that's my hope and then i i want to write um this whole thing that followed from my dream i call it the z theory but i want to i want to write about that so we'll see where that goes is i can also like contain pictures and stuff. I don't know about that. Okay. I think it'll be more like a uh, a paper, maybe yeah. a, a long paper. Okay. Yeah. But, no, that's yeah. cool. I mean, honestly, I didn't know your book had pictures, <laughs> so that's when I was telling you like we had to reschedule because I need more time to read your book, and then I saw like, oh, that's this is easier to read now. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't I, know. Yeah, no I got a lot of pictures in there. <laughs> no, and I I actually like it. You know, because it it does like kind of. Uh, exegete what you're kind of saying in a way you know or the other way around just your yeah. your, your words are kind of like explaining what's going on in the picture so i really <laughs> appreciate that man we'll, we'll be putting the link uh to your book and your website is nakedpastor.com yep and then the lasting supper.com lasting supper and, okay yeah, any and other the, any other links and you're on facebook i'm on obviously. facebook um uh, my books on amazon i'm on youtube naked pastor i'm on etsy i sell my art on etsy oh cool so Twitter. I'm everywhere, man. You're everywhere, I, yeah. I'll, I'll be linking all that Instagram, stuff. Instagram, right? Pinterest. Ah, uh, you are everywhere. Tumblr, <laughs> LinkedIn. Nice, nice. Google Plus. Cool. Know. I'll I'll be linking. Hopefully, I'll remember all of those. But I'll linking most of those things. So it's all yeah. good, man. So David, it's, it's been fun. You know, thank you. Thanks, Thanks for being Josh. on the show and you know your commitment to drawing every day. I didn't know you do that. Yeah. So that, that's pretty cool, man. So yeah. Thanks for being on the show. Till next time, bro. Awesome. Thanks. All right. Thanks very much, Josh. All right. No problem. Take care, bro. Take care. All right. Bye bye. Yo, I really enjoyed the interview. I love David's transparency, just sharing the highs and lows of life and not wanting to sugarcoat anything. You know, for me, to be honest, I don't want to just hear about the good times. I want to hear about the crap you went through and see if there's any depth to what you're saying, you know, because just like everyone else, I go through tough times. And I'm sure you have too. And it's encouraging to hear someone's story you can identify with in some ways. But at the same time, knowing that the sun eventually rises. You know what I'm saying? And if you left the institutional church and you're struggling with loneliness, hang in there. You're not alone. You know, there are a lot of people like you and it's just a matter of finding each other. So be sure to check out David's latest book, Questions Are the Answers on Amazon.com. And of course, his other books as well. Also, if you're into audiobooks like me, remember I teamed up with audible.com and you can download any book absolutely free. With a free 30-day trial, you can choose from more than 180,000 audio titles from there. That's a lot of options. And, you know, listen to your new book in your car or while you're walking or even while you're cleaning the house. You know, that's the cool thing with audiobooks. You can pretty much multitask and get some good information or even hear a good story at the same time. Just go to www.audibletrial.com slash flipside. Again, that's www.audibletrial.com slash flipside for any free audiobook of your choice. So go check it out. Free is always good. And if you really enjoy this podcast or if it's helped you in any way and you have a few bucks to spare, consider supporting me on something called Patreon. You can give as little as $5 or $2 or even $1. Really, any amount helps. So it's really up to you. It's like a tip jar, you know, saying, hey, Josh, we appreciate the time and effort you put into the show and would love to help keep it going. And so any help would really mean a lot to me, guys. You can go to www.patreon.com slash Joshua Tongle. So just my name at the Patreon website. Again, that's www.patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash 
Joshua Tongle. And I'll leave a link in the show notes if that's something you want to do. Don't forget to subscribe to this podcast and please take a few minutes to write a review and to rate the flip side on iTunes. It's really easy and it'll really help more people discover the show. And of course, please share this podcast with your friends on Facebook or word of mouth, wherever, you know, because based on the messages I've been getting, this show is changing a lot of people's lives, you know, which is really awesome. Alrighty, guys, once again, thanks for listening and I'll see you guys on the flip side. I'm out. Peace.